Jesus also sought you out to be a disciple because he knew you before you were born. He had a plan for your life and your salvation before you were born. And each of us as Christians can say that about our lives. You know, as I was, as I was writing those words, I, I was thinking about, uh, I'll, I'll express my opinion here. My opinion is my opinion that this is one of the reasons that Satan fights so hard for abortion because he doesn't want the next generation of pastors and evangelists to be born. So uh, I'll, I'll back out of my opinion now and go back to the lesson. <laughs> we also saw last week that just as Jesus was able to use ordinary fishermen with no special abilities or talents to do great things for his kingdom, he is able to use you and to use me to do great things if we are willing to be obedient to his call like these men were. So this week, we're going to pick up with chapter 5. So we're going to look at the first 11 verses in Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> it says, Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Okay, before we go on, I, I need to point out here that Matthew didn't write his gospel in chronological order, but more in topical order. Now, the Gospel of Luke is written more in chronological order, and the book of Luke uh, puts this event much later in Jesus's ministry when he was attracting very large crowds. If you remember, uh, in, one of, in one crowd, there were 5,000 just men. Uh, in another crowd, there were 4,000 men. Uh, I mean, you add their, their wives and families. I mean, these were very large crowds. Um, so it says here that he saw these crowds. So Luke tells us uh, also that just before this, this sermon that Jesus was about to preach right here, just before this, Jesus called his disciples together and he picked 12 men to be his apostles. So let's look at those definitions just for a second. The word disciple simply means learner. And there was a large group of people that followed Jesus and were his disciples. They were learners. I've heard numbers as large as maybe 100 people that followed Jesus from village to village as his disciples. But he picked 12 and he made them apostles. Now that word apostle just means messenger, but they became, those 12 men became Jesus's inner circle. Then it said, uh, it says that Jesus, it's um, in verse one, now he saw the crowds. Let's talk about the crowds. Who were in these big crowds um, that, that were coming? Um, a, a number of different kinds of people. And first of all, you had the curious. When Jesus was, was performing these incredible miracles, so there were those that were coming to see these miracles. They were, there were many who were in the crowds that were coming because they wanted healing, and Jesus healed them. Um, there, there were those in the crowd who wanted free food, I suspect, uh, because twice he had fed huge crowds of people. Um, there, there were many uh, that were coming to hear Jesus because they were, they were, they were wanting freedom from Rome. And they were expecting the Messiah to be a physical uh, military leader to give them freedom from Rome. There were people in the crowds uh, pretty much every time that were enemies of Jesus. Uh, they were wanting to stop his ministry. Uh, these were primarily the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the scribes. Um, 
these guys were threatened by Jesus. Jesus was threatening their their fame and their popularity and their great wealth. Um, so they wanted to stop him. And there were some in the crowds who were truly seeking a message from God. <clears throat> Although there was a, a, a large crowd present, um, this sermon that Jesus preached was directed primarily to his disciples. Verse one that I read, it says his disciples came to him and he began to teach them. There's a truth here. And the truth is the crowds needed trained disciples and the people still do. The crowd still do. And we all should be training others and be in training throughout our whole lives. God calls us to be trainers and to be trained throughout our lives. <clears throat> you know, as, as, as most of you know, these verses that I just read are called the Beatitudes, right? Uh, that's from the Latin word beatus, uh, which means blessed. Um, in, in some translations, sometimes this word is translated happy. Happy are they that do these things. Well, I mean, the meaning, it, it does include that meaning of happy, but that word really has a much fuller meaning and a much deeper meaning than that. I mean, it, it includes hope, peace, joy, freedom from fear. Uh, that's really what this Jesus was talking about when he said, blessed are the people that do them that do these things. It's more than just happiness. You know, these nine Beatitudes are short and easy to read. Uh, easy to read. I, just, I just read them there in just a few seconds. But each of them have many layers of meaning and many subtle truths are contained in each one. There, there have been many books and many commentaries written about just these 12 verses that I just read. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit. And, and although there are many interpretations about these verses, I believe that these two that I'm about to talk about are probably the best two primary interpretations that I've seen. So two interpretations of, these, of the Beatitudes. Number one, these verses show the steps necessary for a lost person to come to salvation. And number two, these verses describe the kinds of people Christ wants his followers to be. So let's look at them one by one. Verse three says, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know, for a lost person, this verse means that they have to come to a realization that there is something missing in their life an inner emptiness, and that there is nothing they can do to save themselves. For us, this verse means <clears throat> that we need to realize that we are poor in our own spirit, and we must rely on God's Holy Spirit in us in order to do his will. Verse 4 says, <clears throat> blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. You know, lost people need to have a grief over the sin in their lives to draw them to salvation. And for us, we also should mourn over this, the sins that we commit because those sins damage our relationship with our Savior. Verse five says, blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. You know, meekness is sometimes equated with cowardice or weakness, but that's certainly not what it means here. You know, in, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, Jesus said that he was meek and lowly in heart. So the kind of meek person described here by Jesus is one who yields himself completely to God and allows God complete control of his life, just as Jesus did throughout his entire earthly ministry. Verse six says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. You know, the Holy Spirit will put a hunger and thirst for God in the hearts of lost people to draw them to himself. And each of us should have a hunger and a thirst to remain in a right relationship with our Lord. I knew I know when I when my I'm when I'm in a not when I'm not in a right relationship with my Lord my whole life goes off kilter and, and I, I have a, a thirst and a hunger to get back in a right relationship with my Lord. Verse seven says, blessed 
Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. You know, lost people need mercy instead of justice. And each of us should show mercy because we have been given mercy. Verse 8 says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. You know, purity of heart here speaks of one's attitude and motivation. A lost person must come to God with the right attitude and, and the right motivation. And for us, we must serve God with the right attitude and motivation. You know, unlike the, uh, the Pharisees and the Sad Sadducees who were following Jesus around for the absolute wrong motivation and attitudes, we must have the right attitude. We must be pure in heart as we serve. <clears throat> Verse 9 says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. You know, in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, it says, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> you know, that word justified says we have been justified. That word, word justified is a legal term, and it means declared not guilty and cleared of all charges. We have been declared not guilty of every sin that we ever committed. And a few verses down in Romans 5.10, it says, we were enemies of God, but because we have been justified through faith, we now have peace with God. As Christians, peace should be one of the, one of the nine fruits of the Spirit in our life, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Peace should be one of the fruits that people see in our life. And whenever there is any strife, we should strive to be peacemakers so people will recognize us as God's children because it said the peacemakers shall be called children of God. Verse 10 says, <clears throat> blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know, Jesus was preaching to Jews during this time, and Jesus knew that Jews who accepted him would face persecution. And that's still true today for Muslims and, and many other uh, people around the, the, the world. Uh, persecution of Christians is very widespread. Millions are undergoing persecutions today. Um, and here, Jesus gave these people that are going through persecution, he gave them a promise that would, that would be blessed in spite of the persecution. You know, that same promise is also true of Christians. And James even said in James chapter 1, verse 2, that we should consider it pure joy when we face trials. And then a few verses down in verse 12, he says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial because he has stood the test. He will, be, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to all who love him. You know, notice that Jesus didn't promise us laughter or pleasure or health or earthly prosperity, but he did promise us comfort that we will be his children that we will reign with him, and that we will, we will spend eternity with him. Okay, let's read on now. Let's pick up with uh, verse 13 in Matthew 5. <clears throat> it says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on, a, on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. You know, we've probably all heard many sermons preached on these three verses about salt and light. And, you know, there, there's two obvious analogies that are the, the two obvious analogies that you normally hear in the sermons is that salt is a preservative and our lives and our prayers are what keep the world from decaying morally and spiritually. And that because the world is in spiritual darkness today, 
because of sin, and it's our job to shine the light of the gospel for people to see their way out of darkness. How many have heard that sermon before, right? Okay, probably many of you. I, I've heard that one preached uh, more than once. <clears throat> and, and the meaning in these verses is of, of that, of that, those, that sermon about the, the, the preservative and the light shining in darkness, that, that is true. That is, that is a true uh, biblical interpretation of those verses, but there are many more uh, applications and symbolisms to the salt and, and to the light, many, many more than that. I'll, I'll give you a few of them, okay? Salt was a medicine for the sick and injured, and our life and our testimony is medicine for the sickness of sin. Salt is a seasoning. People should see our joy and our peace and our hope and want that kind of seasoning in their lives. Salt was an Old Testament offering. It was the salt offering. <clears throat> and we are to make our bodies a living sacrifice to God. Salt was an Old Testament sign to seal a covenant. And our lives are sealed by God in our new covenant relationship with him. Salt creates thirst and people should thirst for what we have. You know, back then, salt was very valuable, and it was often used for wages for the Roman soldiers. That's, that's where we get our phrase, he's not worth his salt, it was because that was their wages. Salt changes what it touches, such as salt melting ice on a road, or, or salt making metal rust, and we should change the lives of the people we touch. You know, remember, <laughs> We are to love and lead all people to what? Change, right? Life change in Christ. So we should be salt in that sense also. Salt can be a poison. I mean, a sailor who drinks salt water will die. And our lives should be a poison to sin. Impurities in salt can cause it to be worthless. And impurities of sin in our lives can cause our testimony to be worthless. You know, please, please notice in these verses 13 and 14 that we just read, those verses said, you are the salt and you are the light. Folks, it's not optional. It's not a part-time assignment. We are salt. You are salt. I am salt and light. You know, it's part of the job description of being a Christian. In, in case you have forgotten, or in case you didn't know, when we got saved, we entered into a covenant agreement with God. He agreed to save us and give us eternal life, and we agreed to make him Lord of our, Lord of our lives and follow his instructions and be salt and light. But let's talk about light for a minute. We talked about salt. You know, light is really interesting. In physics, light is a really strange phenomenon. You know, light travels and behaves as a wave, and we can measure its wavelengths. But light also travels and behaves as particles. Those particles are called photons. Now, photons have energy, and photons have momentum, but they, they have zero mass. They have no mass. Now, light travels at the speed of 186,000 miles per second, and nothing we've observed in the known universe moves faster than light. And under Einstein's theories, light speed is the ultimate speed limit, but anything with mass can never reach the speed of light because it would need infinite energy to do so. <laughs> you know, if that makes your brain hurt like it hurts mine, you ought to tiptoe into quantum mechanics where you know one electron can be in two places at the same time and they can pair two electrons and when you can you can exert a force on one of those electrons and the other one will move in response to that even if it's miles away you know i was thinking about when jesus made light back up a bit jesus made light okay so I can just imagine him smiling when he said there on that mountain, you are the light of the world, knowing 
that it would be 2000 years before people could even imagine or, or begin to understand what light is and all the symbolisms of, of our light, our, of our lives as light. Um, you know, we're not gonna go into a, a long list of symbolisms for light in our lives like, like I did with salt. Um, I'm sure if, if we could, uh, if we were together, we could probably come up with a, with a lot, a long list of symbols. Uh, you know, light gives warmth, uh, light gives comfort, light drives away darkness and fear, uh, light is necessary uh, to give us vitamin D for life. <clears throat> we're, not gonna, we're not gonna go through too many more of those. But the question we do want to answer right now is this, how do we let our light shine? <clears throat> okay, well, there's an easy answer. The answer is in verse 16 that we read just a minute ago. That verse says, let your light shine before men that they may see what? Your good deeds, okay? Folks, our shining light is our good deeds. <clears throat> and one pastor, pointed this out when he was preaching this. He said, by the way, most of the darkness is outside the church. So if all of your shining light good deeds are being done inside the church, you might want to rethink that. You know, um, let's look at James uh, chapter 2, verse 14. <clears throat> James says this, what good is it, my brother, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. We're talking about basic human needs here. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by what I do. Faith in our lives is important. It's very important. But if it is not accompanied by action, with, by good deeds in our life, it is a dead faith, as it says here. Now, the word translated dead there is the Greek word nekros. We get the word necrosis from that. Um, it means dead. It can also mean worthless or idle. You see, if our faith is idle, we're not doing good deeds to help people in need, and it is worthless to others, and we are not obeying the command of our Lord if, we, if our faith is idle. <clears throat> so for the, for the rest of chapter 5, Jesus taught the Old Testament law and how it relates to New Testament Christians. But he first had to teach these people what the Old Testament law actually did and did not teach because the scribes and Pharisees had added hundreds of man-made rules and regulations, and those guys had obscured the meaning of what the, the law actually said and actually meant. So we'll pick up here with verse 17 as Jesus starts to do this. So in, um, let's see, pick, uh, let's go, go back <laughs> I'm in the wrong book. Go back to Matthew, picking up with verse 17. Here we go. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices in teaching these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> So Jesus first, when he got started here talking about the Old Testament law, he first made it very clear that he did not come to abolish the law. Uh, the definition of, of, of abolish, or King James translates that Greek word destroy. Jesus said it did not come to destroy the Old Testament law. Uh, the definition can also include set aside, 
invalidate or disparage. He did not come to do any of that. I mean, after all, think about it. Jesus was the one who gave the old prophets the law to write down. Why would he abolish it? <laughs> as, as, I, as I was writing those words, I thought somebody's going to wonder how I know that it was Jesus who gave the words to the prophets to write down. Uh, though the answer is in John chapter one, verse three, it says all things were made by Jesus. It was through him. All things were made through him and by him. Jesus gave the Old Testament prophets the Old Testament law to write down. And by the way, if you, if you think about what those verse mean, verses mean, if you think all the way back to the very first sentence, the very first words in the Bible in Genesis 1.1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God created the heavens and the earth through Jesus because by him and through him, all things were made that are made. It was through Jesus that God made the heavens and the earth. And it was through Jesus that God gave the Old Testament law to Moses and the prophets. <clears throat> Jesus said he didn't come to abolish it. But what he did come to do was to give the original intent and purpose of the Old Testament law and to give people a new perspective and understanding of the law. Jesus said he came to fulfill the law. And there's at least two meanings of that statement. First of all, he came to fulfill all the Old Testament prophecies about his first coming, and he did just that. The second thing is, he came to give the full meaning of the law. So the, the one meaning of I came to fulfill the law is he came to give the full meaning of the law. <clears throat> you know, the Old Testament law was all about our actions and our outward deeds, now Jesus made it clear that God is just as concerned about our thoughts, our attitudes, and our motives as he is about our action. This was new ground to these people. The Old Testament was all about doing and what we did and our actions. And now Jesus is saying, no, the law is, is also about our motives and our attitudes and our thought. And he used several examples of the Old Testament law to explain their true meaning. You think about it, we're going to go through these uh, as we go through the book of, of Matthew, but he used examples such as adultery. It's not just about the act, it's about thinking and our mind, about murder, about keeping our word, about revenge, about how we should treat our enemy. It has to do not just with our actions, but about our thoughts and our attitudes and our motives. And in each example, as he went through these Old Testament laws and rules, in each example, he set a higher standard of what God expects from us. You know, I was, as I was writing that, I thought the question sometimes comes up and gets asked, why didn't God give the full meaning of the law when he gave it to the Old Testament prophets and when he gave it to Moses? Why not just Give him the whole, give us the whole thing. Why did Jesus need to come and, and give us the full meaning and to tell us what, you know, the, it, it also includes our thoughts? Well, here's my opinion. I, I, this, is, this is me. I believe that this expanded and higher standards of God's law couldn't be either understood nor obeyed until God sent his Holy Spirit to abide in us. I think it's only through the Holy Spirit that we can understand and obey Christ's new commands about the law. <clears throat> I mean, think about it. We're commanded to control our thoughts about lust, about anger, about vengeance. I don't believe that's possible without Holy Spirit in us, helping us and empowering us to do this. You know, he gives us this promise in verse 19, whoever practices and teaching teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So now starting in verse 21, Jesus gives us a whole series of examples concerning the intent and the true meaning of the law. And this is where we'll pick up next week as we continue in and look at the rest of chapter five. 
So let me pray and then uh, we can have questions and discussions. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, um, Lord, we just come before you and praise your name and thank you. Thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for allowing us to study it. Thank you for giving us the meanings, Lord. Help us to remember these beatitudes, uh, to rely on you, to, to mourn, to, to yield ourselves, to hunger and thirst after righteousness, to show mercy, to serve you properly, and to be peace, peacemakers. Lord, help us to be salt for people who need salt and light for people who need light and to love and lead them to life change in Christ. Lord, thank you for reminding us that this is, this is not an optional or part-time assignment, that, that we are in a covenant relationship with you. Lord, help us to understand the true meaning of each of your commands, and, and thank you for your Holy Spirit that gives us the desire and the power to obey your commands. Lord, help us now as we go through this week you know, to remember these things and to obey your commands. It's in Jesus' name I pray it. Amen. Okay, comments.